and then like space. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Muddled Dice. Tonight you've got myself, my co-host Gary, and we've got a guest tonight, Carla Kopp of Weird Giraffe Games, who's here tonight to talk with us about their new board game, Stellar Leap. How's everyone doing? Fantastic. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. How's it going? <laughs> I was paying attention. I was waiting for anybody else that might have. What? Uh, <laughs> good job, Gary. Good job. <laughs> Um, episode that didn't happen. <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like everyone's doing good. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, let's just jump right in then. Um, do you want to give us your elevator pitch for Stellar Leap? Uh, sure, yes, I can do that. Um, so, Stellar Leap, it's a space exploration game for one to four players, and it has worker placement, variable player powers, and a strategic twist on dice rolling, all in about 60 minutes. Nice. How's that for elevator pitch? That's good. I, I like That's the good. energy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so how did Stellar Leap uh, begin? Like, what would, you know, how did it begin life? So, I really wanted to create a game that had dice, but, um, like, so there's some games that have dice, and you roll the dice, and you're like, whoa, that's not, you know, probability dictates that on average it should be seven, and I keep rolling single ones. <laughs> So, you know, I'm just losing this game. So I wanted to create a game that had dice, but um, you could mitigate the dice in some way. So um, you would have basically variable player powers that change the dice. Um, but I also wanted to create a game that had some player interaction. Like, some games I just don't enjoy that much because it's like I'm playing a solo game with people, you know? And I like games that there's more like, like you do interact like there's reasons to talk with the people that you're gaming with because for me gaming is like a super super social thing that i really right. enjoy because of that so it was the uh, the mitigation of the dice uh player interaction and then like space i really enjoy <laughs> space um i actually live in huntsville alabama which is rocket city we have the space and rocket center and nasa and i just really oh. love you know everything about space oh cool i didn't uh i didn't know that about huntsville actually yeah we have nasa and that's why we have you know jobs and stuff <laughs> right right um okay so uh let's yeah let's go could you give us like a little crash course in stellar leap you know what's the like the the main game loop just kind of how to play it real quick sure yeah i can so on your turn um you roll two dice, and then you use your uh, dice manipulation ability. Mm -hmm. um, you, well, you choose between yours and a shared universal ability that anyone can use. Um, it's less effective typically than yours, but it gives you a good option. Like, if your ability can't do anything, um, then you can use that. Oh. So why you're doing this is because um, there's a galaxy, and all the planets are under um, dice cards that go from one to six. So... When you choose the dice, um, for instance, if you choose like two and three, um, the dice or the planets that are under the dice columns two, three, and five will all generate resources. So that means that, um, well, it includes the sum. So the five and the six will generate resources a lot more than the one will um, because probability. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so um, you might. You can use your ability in however way you want. You might want to like negotiate with people, like say like, "Hey, I will let you get resources now on your turn if on um, if on your turn, like if you can, you'll give me resources." So it can add like a negotiation aspect to it. Oh, or cool. you could just be like, uh, some people don't like to help people at all, so they will <laughs> purposely make them not generate resources. Um, but yeah, after you decide how the dice roll. Uh, then it goes into the action phase. In this action phase, you can do high command actions, two of them. You can do division actions. You have three different divisions, and you have movement. And you can do these in any order that you want. So for the high command actions, you can populate by spending two food and one water, and then you add another population to the board. And this means if you move it to a certain planet, you have the possibility of gaining more resources when people roll dice. 
Um, there's also taxing, where you can get two resources of your choice, and that's it. There is discovering, where you draw two cards um, from either the safe or the dangerous planet deck. And then you choose one, and you discover it. Um, which means you place it under one of the dice columns and then you put your chit on it to show that you did discover that planet. And the okay. last high command action is attacking. So with attacking, you have to have the majority on a pop or majority population on a planet. And then you just attack it. Um, and you can send whoever is the, on that planet scattering to another planet in that solar system. Um, it doesn't cost them any resources to scatter, but then they're exhausted, which means that they can't gather resources from that planet until they're the start of their next turn. So you get to choose two of those, and then you get to do your division actions. Well, you can do them in whatever order, but I'm talking about it in a certain order. So division actions. Um, the first one is your intelligence division. Um, with this division, you get to do missions, meaning if you have the right resources, you can take a mission, uh, you get a reward of some resources, but you also get victory points, which are hmm. prestige in this game. Um, the second division is the mining division, and this mining division allows you to mine asteroids. So when you discover asteroids, they come out with a uh, counter on them, um, and every time you mine them, you look at the counter, and that's how many dice you roll. So you roll the dice, um, and the highest value die that you roll, um, you get that amount of resources plus whatever else the asteroid has on it. Okay. So there's a bit of a like, push your luck, because you should get to that asteroid first to have the highest chance of getting the most resources. But um, if there's still an asteroid die on there, even if it's a one, you'll get some amount of resources. Hmm. And then the final division is the labor division. And this one, you just exhaust a population and you get a certain amount of resources based on the planet that you exhaust on. So okay. that means you get guaranteed resources, but then that population cannot gather resources until the start of your next turn. So it's if you want guaranteed or the possibility of getting a lot of resources. Okay. And then the final is just movement and you can move anywhere in the galaxy that you want. Okay, cool. Oh, and did you then, have one? Okay. <laughs> yes. So, so while this is happening, you can trigger events. Okay. And events, um, yeah, they're just triggered by player events. Um, they happen when all players get to three, six, or nine population. Um, the third, sixth, or ninth asteroid is discovered. Um, you finish a tier of missions, or you complete a solar system. And those things are all triggered by players. And you just draw one of the event cards. And these events, they can be uh, instant, where they instantly give you a certain amount of resources or take away resources, or they can last the entire game, where it might change how movement works or how certain planets generate resources. It really depends on the event. Oh, okay. That sounds really cool. I like the, um, I, I like the event system. That's pretty neat. So, um, also with the event system, the typical game has six events. Okay. But say that you're learning the game or you don't have as much time to play, you can just play until four events. Or you have two hours and you want to play a really epic game, you can go to ten events if you want. <laughs> okay, cool. So it's kind of like you can expand it and contract it for your time budget. Yeah. That's nice. Cool. So you mentioned victory points, so I'm guessing... The end goal is to be like have the most victory points after so many events. Yes, to be the most prestigious. Okay, okay, I got it. Cool. Um, That's a good goal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, one thing I noticed looking at the um, at your Kickstarter and reading about the game is you've got a single player mode, which I think is really nice because like as an adult, it seems really hard to get a bunch of people together to play a two-hour board game, you know? Um, yeah. What made you decide that, hey, Stellar Leap should have a, a quality single-player mode? Well, the first thing that I uh, saw was um, Jamie Stegmeier, he did a poll mm -hmm. in one of his uh, Kickstarters where he asked people, do you want a solo mode or do you want a fifth-player mode? And I think what came out was it was about 50-50. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, like, I look for the fifth-player, like, always, because <laughs> we always have, like, 
you know, if I could get a good game that plays well at five and six players, like, that's amazing. But then I was like, do people really play solo that much? But then, like, I started asking people on Twitter, like, in about solo, and there were so many people that responded just so positively. Like, I just, I found this thing that I didn't realize was just so <laughs> popular. Yeah. I think it's it, that I always ask for. Yep. Because I, in the middle of nowhere, compared to where Dan and anybody else that would join <laughs> in, in the game is, and sometimes like there's there's no one else, but I want to enjoy the story or, or the gameplay. I think personally that uh, player mode is uh, important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. So I was like looking into it and stuff and then it became like this challenge that I had to make like a really good solo <laughs> mode because there, well there's a I listened to a couple podcasts and a couple articles and it seemed like this relatively easy thing to do they're just like hey make it simple make it fast uh make it you know play well like try to emulate a player but not like actually emulate a player okay. um so yeah I like to challenge myself with stuff like that so um Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So what kind of, um, the Kickstarter seems like it's going pretty well for you. I mean, you were funded in like, what, a few days, right? 27 hours. E, not even, not even two days. That's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. So what kind of marketing and like awareness campaigning did you do before launching the Kickstarter that you think helped get that awesome result? So I've been on Twitter for a while. Well, hmm. I've been on Twitter um, for like two years now, like talking up to people. But um, one of the main things I do is like, I talk about like everything that's going on with me. So there's <laughs> been like these people that like have seen Stellar Leap when it was still like a word document. And like, I just talk about like, oh yeah, this thing went well, or I tried out this thing and you know, that was really lame. Like what, <laughs> you know, I found out something that didn't work. Um, so I think that helped a lot. Um, I also started interviewing different um, Kickstarter creators or game designers, okay. and I do that with the Indie Game Report, and I think that helped. I'm, I also like learned a lot from mm -hmm. doing it, um, so that was really cool. cool. Um, oh, I also lined up like a certain amount of interviews and podcasts and stuff beforehand, um, and I went to uh, Gen Con and Origins. And I just demoed like so much at both Gen Con and Origins. Oh, that's cool. So you just had like prototypes made up and took them and showed people how to play and gave them like your card and stuff? Yeah. So um, at Origins, they had the unpub room and I basically lived in that room the entire, you know, like five days of the convention. And it was amazing um, because it was a bunch of game designers playtesting other people's games and like giving oh, okay. like amazing feedback. Like I would play test my game like three or four times a day and like just you know iterate like play uh change something play again like it was fantastic because you have <laughs> these designers that like know how games should work so they would give like really excellent feedback and it also taught me a lot more about um how to like well like when you're play testing you really have to like watch people and like try to understand what they're thinking and what they're doing and that really helped out like just play testing over and over again and mm -hmm. doing the people watching like i got super like a lot better at play testing so conventions is kind of something because like gary and i are working on uh board games and going to conventions is kind of something we've debated whether it's worth it if you're not having if you don't have anything to sell um because they're pretty expensive to like get even like a booth or into those areas so in your opinion is it is it worth it if you're not going to make any money at the convention just for the exposure and experience definitely so origins was just fantastic i got to hang out with game designers for five days like Ooh, nice. you know 24 7 like it was just game design mm. all the time like i got to make so many connections with people it was kind of crazy like every time i'd go like walk to go get food somewhere i'd find somebody and be like hey are you eating because i'm gonna eat somewhere and then we'd go eat eat there and i would like meet their friends and they would meet my friends and it was just a nice. big networking event like 
well not really networking because like we're all friends now like i talked to all these people well i did talk to them online but now it's like more personal like we're all just friends um yeah. but even then like uh for gen con uh i got there on tuesday and i didn't get a booth or anything like that but i got to be there while people were standing in line so i just handed people my card and talked at them <laughs> while they were in line and i got to do that for like a couple hours and i think that really helped and that cost nothing but the cards oh. um but you can also um get tables um i was not smart enough to know about this um but you can get your um your game demoed and stuff just get a table people can sign up they pay two dollars to play your game but then you get people like interested in your game um they also had in it's not an um pub room but it was something else like a first exposure room for all the people that you know for the games that aren't yeah. published yet okay. so i'm not sure if that costs money or not but i know getting the table is just for people to to sign up and play your game was free hmm, that's cool um, yeah, so what I did during Gen Con, because I didn't know about the whole table sign up thing, is I just, you know, take a picture of me and be like, hey, this is me, and I'm in this spot, come hang out. And I got to meet a bunch of people that way. And, like, even though um, Gen Con is different from Origins in that you, you can meet, like, so many people at Gen Con, but you usually only see them for, like, a half an hour or 20 minutes or something. But mm. at Origins, you, like, spend the day with people. Oh, okay is it so is origins like a smaller crowd then or yes it's much smaller okay. and it's for more days oh i got you i got you okay cool well that uh, that's all sounds like good advice i think gary and i should uh look into some of that um yeah, we should i hadn't i hadn't heard i mean i think that i had heard in passing about gen con i hadn't heard anything yeah. about origins yeah. yeah, like that's my favorite convention. I'm also going to Unpub this year, like the big Unpub, and I've heard that that is also amazing. Okay, cool. I've never heard of that one actually. I'll have to, I'll have to what? look into that. Yeah. You should go. I we're know. Pre we're, 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 we're pretty <laughs> we're new to this whole scene. We're also not on table, so. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, okay, so uh, let's go back to to Stellar Leap. Um, what kind of did you draw any inspiration from either other board games or even like even like books or movies so um for our other games i really like valeria card kingdoms and settlers of Catan. um nice. for the whole dice rolling and everyone gets resources on everyone's turn mm -hmm. nice um as far as like uh, other media like i love star trek and i really <laughs> I think that like Stellar Leap is kind of like more of a Star Trek game versus like, nice. well, Star Wars has, of course, you know, the wars and the fighting, but sure. um, the fighting in uh, or the attacking in Stellar Leap is much more like Star Trek where, you know, you fight, but like people don't really die that often. Right. So it's it's kind of like <laughs> harmless attacking. Like it, it matters, but it doesn't really matter. Right. <laughs> um, quick aside. Have you seen the new uh, the new Star Trek? No, I haven't. So I really like to watch like a lot of episodes all at the same time. So I'm oh, okay. trying not to be spoiled, and I just <laughs> want to watch like ten. Like, right. can you imagine that? Like ten new Star Treks like on one day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm Perfect I'm day. I'm working my way through Voyager right now. So for me, oh. I've got like four four more seasons of it. So that's. Yes, like, I just watched Voyager, like, a couple months ago, like, for the first time, all of it, and it was, like, the best, like, three months, because it was, right? like, every day was Star Trek day. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's funny, actually, you mentioned that, because, um, uh, Mine and Gary's, one of the games we worked on, The Dangerous Sea, that was kind of inspired by Star Trek Voyager, where I was, like, I want a game where you just, like, explore an unknown thing, and somehow space turned into an ocean, but... Well, it's so. similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, let's talk about Weird Giraffe Games now. Um, how did that come about? I know there's, okay. um, it's you, uh, your husband, right? Yes, Nick. And, and someone else who I don't recognize. Our cat anymore. Fluffins. Your cat? <laughs> your cat. <laughs> <laughs> he he is, okay, awesome. he is on the website. He is a legit part of this. Awesome. <laughs> 
He always knocks things over. Okay, that's his job. Well, that's important. That's important for board games. <laughs> um, so how did weird draft games come about? Like, you know. Okay, so um, I was at Dragon Con one year, and with Dragon Con, you can only go to a certain number of events per day because you have to like stand in line for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So I had like an open period, and I didn't know what to do, so I was like looking at different stuff. And one of the things I saw was this panel on how to design a board game, and I was like, you know, I like board games, and I'm not doing anything <laughs> right now, and I don't think this is that far away. Like, I can walk, like, across the hall. So I went there, and they just talked about, you know, how easy it was to, to start designing games. Like, you just need some note cards, and that's all you need, and just go for it and do it. So, um, you know, after that, um, well, uh, also during Dragon Con, uh, we were standing in line for like long periods of times, like an hour, two hours, you know, that was pretty common at Dragon Con. Mm. And we had Love Letter, and nice. one of the things we did was try to like develop a way to play Love Letter while standing. And we <laughs> did this by like just instead of discarding cards, just putting them face out in our hand. Okay. So those two things happened. And then we had a four hour drive on the way back. And I was like, okay. I know how to design a game now. I went to a panel that was, you know, 50 minutes. I got this. And, you know, we, we kind of did the designing with the love letter. Like, let's make a game that's designed to uh, play while standing in line. And it can be about hacking. Hmm. And okay. that's how it began. Cool. So that was, um, that was Weird Draft Games' first game, which, sorry, I can't remember the name of it right now. <laughs> Super Hack Override. Super Hack Override. That's right. Um, so, and that one was successfully funded too, right? Yes, it was last September. Awesome. So, what kind of um, what lessons from from that Kickstarter campaign did you apply to this one to ensure this one was also successful? So, I did a lot of the same things, but I just did like a lot more of them. Okay. Um, like for Super Hack Override, I'd gone to Gen Con and that was really cool. So um, for Stellar Leap, I was like, I should go to more conventions. And that's how I went to Origins. And I went to a couple other ones. Like uh, there was a science fiction and fantasy fest in Birmingham and another uh, Rocket City Game Fest. Um, mm. So I just started like going to a lot more conventions and talking with people and increasing the whole social media thing, but also increasing the amount of interviews. Like I did a certain amount of interviews for um, Super Hack and I contacted all those people again. And then I also contacted more people. So nice. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I can't read my notes. Oh, yeah. OK, so. Um, so after this Kickstarter and you fulfill all your successful orders, um, what's next for Stellar Leap and Weird Giraffe? So um, I'll answer one and then the other. So what's okay. next for Weird Giraffe games? Um, it is between one of two games. Uh, what will probably be next is this game called Observance, and it's going to hmm. be a game about stargazing and being an astronomer. Um, so in this game... You have to identify constellations, but you have to identify them with the proper stars. There's different sorts of stars, like there's yellow ones, white ones, blue ones. So hmm. you have to have the proper stars that match your constellation. Um, but another aspect of being an astronomer, probably, is that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not real astronomy. It is like what you think of when you think of astronomy. Uh, that's kind of what my games are. Like Super Hack Override is not actual hacking. It's like what media thinks of hacking. Right. So um, <laughs> uh, with observance, um, all astronomers, they work at night. And in the winter, the night is really long and you can get a lot of things done. But in the summer, there's a short night. And so you have to... Um, make sure you do your time management, like get the things done that you need to get done or else you won't. Hmm. So do you have like um, some kind of like calendar or season system in it? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, oh, so um, oh, yeah. the other game idea that my, hmm. like I think Observance will come next, but um, the other game that I have a prototype of is called Drapple. Well, it's 
it's like code name Drapple. Um, but it is a uh, abstract gardening color theory game where okay. you have all these different colors of cards and they're different kinds of flowers and you have to create like a really beautiful garden. Oh, huh, that sounds cool. Um, kind of reminds me of what's that that out of print game, uh, Tiny Parks or no, Arborist. Okay. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, I think it's like a you like plant trees in a park and you try to make it look nice, but it's it's out of print, so it's like, you know, 60, 80 bucks for a card game. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. That's I know. a bit much. Sad. <laughs> um, so, yeah. um, also, what's next for Stellar Leap? So, um, I, ha I, re I really enjoyed, like, playing Pandemic Legacy, and then I played Seafall, and that was, like, more iffy, but I really enjoyed the legacy aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I want to make, like, a Stellar Leap not exactly a legacy uh, game, but more of a campaign game. Okay. So I have all these stories. So you're going to be like playing Stellar Leap, but then you're going to read part of a story and then be able to make a choice. And then based on your choices and whether you succeed or fail at doing the thing that you decided to do, certain things will happen and you'll be able to play a big campaign about this. Like I'm thinking 10 games if you're successful. That sounds cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so with the Kickstarter, let's go back to that a bit. Um, were there any unexpected hurdles or like pleasant surprises? Anything unusual that you didn't expect? Uh, yes. Yeah. So one thing I've learned, always ask questions, especially questions like, when are you going to post that? Um, sometimes like, like um, <laughs> I volunteered... Uh, to be interviewed at uh, al.com mm -hmm. and if you're in alabama you read al.com i'm not really sure why but you do um so i contacted them and they're like yeah we'll do an interview and then i talked to them and then the next day it was posted and i was like whoa what that was fast that my kickstarter isn't live yet and then i got to see people like kick on the kickstarter link that they couldn't back and i was like oh no <laughs> why so um yes always ask people because um if they really like the interview maybe they should be able to to buy the thing if they want to buy the thing right yeah um but what were some really cool things were um i had a couple of reviewers like just approach me about things and they were like hey yeah if you send me a game or a print and play i'll just review it for you and i was like whoa what yes you can do that here's a print and play i have one because like i have to print and play it so uh yeah that was really cool um that happened with oh uh, like i know people's names and i don't always know their um their sites but um mm. david wiley he was amazing um because uh he did the solo mode but uh well, he, he reviewed like the solo version of it, but I got to talk back and forth with him about solo and he helped me make it like a lot better. Like he told me things like, hey, uh, you made uh, the scoring system really simple. So like, I feel like I should calculate it all the time and that's not good. And I was like, oh, don't make <laughs> everything simple. Okay, I hmm. got that. That's so. interesting. And I had another uh, reviewer just ask for a print and play, and it's like, yes, of course. Like, just <laughs> if you want to talk about my game, I will let you talk about my game. That's that's right. great. Why not? <laughs> but always be prepared because, um, yeah, like he, um, the latest one asked me for um, a print and play, so I just had it. But then he he was also like, hey, can I have some art? And I was like, yeah, I have these zip files, two of them just ready to send. So always be like, have have stuff to send people, so then they can just get to reviewing or doing whatever right. they do. Like a like a press kit. Yeah. Nice. So, um, speaking of like uh, kind of prototypes, you have a version of Stellar Leap on Tabletopia, right? Yes. What's your experience been using Tabletopia to kind of pull people in and let people know about your game? So. I would say, like, I don't really have that experience. Like, we did it because um, I think it was uh, Dan Letzgrid from um, 
Letterman Games was like, yeah, Tabletopia. Okay. So we were like, yeah, we'll put it on Tabletopia. <laughs> but we haven't really used it. Um, so far, we got people that were complaining that it wasn't identical to the real rules in the game. And it was like, but it's mm. Tabletopia. You can't. <laughs> like like you have to set it up a certain way and yeah. you have to play like that regardless of the number of players and yeah um but i think um it is a good resource if you need like if you're in an area where you can't play test with people i think it would be like fantastic i prefer to meet with people and play test with them sure and i have that option like i really like i just i know a lot of people and i know um, the people that know people, like, um, talking with game stores and stuff, I'll be like, hey, can I just come and demo this game? And they're like, yeah, we'll advertise for you. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Nice. <laughs> uh, all right. So I think that's, I mean, that's the end of my talking points. Gary, do you have anything you wanted to ask? Uh, where, I, I'm sure that I could probably find this on the site. Where are you located? Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, that's right. You did say that. I saw <laughs> that. Um, I saw that one of the cons was uh, where was it? Um, Indianapolis. That is Gen Con. Yeah, Gen Con. Mm -hmm. How far did you fly, or you drive, or um, how far away is that? Uh, we drove, and it was six hours. Ooh. But, yeah. okay, so also knowing people, like I asked Twitter, I was like, hey, who's going to Gen Con and wants to drive me there? And my great friend Jeremy, the Game Geek Ninja, was like, hey, I'm going. And I was like, okay. And he was also like, hey, we're leaving on Tuesday. And I was like, guess I'm leaving on Tuesday. Have to find a hotel. <laughs> um, wow. But yeah, it was really awesome because then like uh, we got to carpool. I didn't have to drive. I could work while doing it. But I also got to hang out with Jeremy, who is an amazing person. Nice. Nice. I'd also recommend telling people what hotel you're in if you're at Gen Con, because I ended up in the same hotel as Eric from What's Eric Playing. So we got oh. to Uber. Or oh, actually, we did cool. not Uber. We lifted. We lifted <laughs> every day together. And it was like, yeah, we get to get money. But also, we get to hang out together. Right. Nice. I just, just for kicks, I looked up how long it would take us to get from DC to there. It'd be nine hours and seventeen minutes. Oh my god! No stops. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should fly. Yeah. We considered it, but you know, we also got a you know pretty cheap ride, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I don't, I it's don't like me. driving, so that would be rough. <laughs> yeah, just carpool. Like, I think if I go to Pax Unplugged, I'm just gonna hitch a ride with people. Cause like, why drive? Other people right. can do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're in a dense area. Like, if we wanted to go to some sort of event, like, even if we wanted to go to New York, it would only take us probably about four and a half, five hours, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not bad. So like, like, out past Ohio and all that, that's that's a long drive through mountains <laughs> and, and nothing. Else. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coming from our direction, at least. Yes. yes. Yeah, coming from, well, from D.C. Well, the Midwest yeah. is kind of... It's a lot of corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I drove, uh, when I was 18, I drove from California to New York State, and there is a lot of corn in the Midwest. You were right. <laughs> yeah, that sounds absolutely terrible. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, two more things before we go. Do you have any advice for aspiring game devs or Kickstarter campaigners? Uh, yeah, yeah, just keep at it. Like, when you're designing your game, like, you might think that you're like just stuck but like just keep iterating like you're gonna make a great game eventually you just need to keep like thinking about what aspects need to be improved and play testing like just play testing a lot is really important mm -hmm. um and don't give up on yourself because i mean if you believe in yourself you can create something that's fantastic nice okay so last thing before we go we've talked a lot about the game uh, do you want to pitch or do a little ad for the Kickstarter campaign itself? Like talk about the reward tiers or anything? Sure, yes. Okay, so Stellar Leap, it's this, you know, space game where you get to do space stuff. Um, if you just want the base game, it is $39. If you want the um, Stellar Leap Plus, 
the Frontiers expansion, which has more planets and asteroids, really cool events, and more traits. Um, it actually gives you twice the number of traits um, that are also kind of challenging and more uh, more rewarding a little mm -hmm. um, than the other traits. Um, you can get that for an additional $10, so $49. And then you can also get a custom planet. So um, in the game, you every player has a home planet that just is based on the color that they choose. But you could define your own home planet, uh, whatever color. You can name it whatever. And that is $69. And then finally, you can get your name on every uh, copy of Stellar Leap by being the the first person that discovered a certain planet in the game and that's 150 dollars and that will be in every game of stellar leap oh. so um whether you want your name in every game or if you just like to have that one personal card just for yourself um or as a gift i've a couple of people have actually gotten them for gifts and that's been like really cool um so yeah it is a lighter 4x game that you can play in an hour and it has worker placement variable player powers and game changing events and you can change the amount of time that it plays it can fit in whatever time period that you have and player choice really matters like what you do in the game dictates everything awesome and that's uh stellar leap dot space slash ks right Yes, that is one of the links. I use a lot of bitlies. You could also go to okay. stellar-leap.com. Um, yeah, and we're going to be on Kickstarter until October 19th, 10 p.m. Central Time. The, what was that date again? October 19th. October 19th is when is the last day of the Kickstarter? Yes, so make sure to get in before then. You can help us reach some great stretch goals. So far, we have gotten... Um, better card quality, which is, you know, my favorite thing. I love quality in a game. Mm -hmm. um, we are getting so close to getting a score pad added to the game. And the next stretch goal up is the fifth player edition. Um, so the game plays well at, at five players. Um, we have play tested it, unlike some fifth player editions that I've seen in games. Um, <laughs> we just wanted to keep the uh, the base uh, goal down low enough mm -hmm. um, so that we funded fast or Makes funded sense. at all. Um, right. Who knows how Kickstarter campaigns go. Right. So yeah, I'm really excited about the fifth player uh, edition and like making the player boards like really fancy. I have like some really fancy things that I want to do with the game and I can only do that with the help of the backers. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, that's all I've got. Gary, you got anything else you want to say? That's all I've got. I've really enjoyed this. All right, cool. Thanks for being on, Carla. We appreciate it. It's been fun talking to you. Yeah, it's been really fun. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you are welcome back anytime. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. If you like this episode, please like and subscribe, and you'll be notified when we upload another interview or anything else. Good night, everyone. <laughs>